Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Larry Anderson, was haunted by demonic forces uh, during his life, and he'll tell us about that. But he'll finish with one of the most striking encounters that I have heard, and that is he, of course, met Jesus. So he'll talk about the diametrical opposition between the demonic hauntings that he experienced and being ushered before Jesus. He'll talk about what Jesus looks like and he'll share all of that. So my brother, Larry, I thank you for uh, joining us today and it's great to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure. Like I said, your whole platform has definitely blessed me. I'm sure it's blessed the body and I just, I'm just happy to be here to contribute to let people know that Jesus is, is very much real, he's very much alive, and that he's here for all of us. Amen to that. But it wasn't for that way for you early on, was it? I mean, there was uh, these demonic attacks, and there was a reason why they gained uh, entree into your life. And uh, there was a, they led up to a car accident, which is what preceded your meeting with uh, Jesus. But let's start back when... When you were caught up in the, to this cycle of, of attacks and, and what led up to that or what caused that? Okay, Randy, I want to start by um, going back to my childhood. Um, I've always been very spiritual. And as we're taught, a lot of the things spiritually we believe are just in movies or fiction or in books. So I had two loving parents, um, unfortunately, they were not perfect, but we know our parents can only do the best they can with us. Um, my father, a good man, struggled with alcohol addiction. And in so, it was a lot of arguments between my parents, typical married arguments, but you don't realize at the time how that can affect children in the home. So now, being further in Christ, I've been led by the Holy Spirit to realize that so many demonic doors were opened in childhoods, I mean, just for a couple examples, I remember laying in beds at night and always having a fear of the dark and going to the restroom alone. It was a fear that was instilled in me. I had no reason to have this fear. In fact, I didn't. I don't recollect this fear until maybe the age of three or four. But even in those times, I've had experiences with a lot of people would call shadow people, where they would see black figurettes going in, running around the walls, coming in and out of closets. And I'm sure plenty of children have experienced this, but going back to what I said, we're always told that it's a child's imagination, you know what I'm saying, or too much TV. But these things are very much real. Um, one specific time I can't remember, I was uh, in bed, afraid to go to the bathroom. As I said before, I was around the age of five or six. And I had always seen the shadow figures and they scared me. But this particular night, I actually got up to face my fears and use the restroom. I turned the corner to go into the restroom, Brother Randy, and there were three witches in the flesh, rocked me. I dropped and I let out a scream that probably woke up the whole neighborhood. My parents came running out, consoling me, asking me what happened. I'm all like, three witches, three witches. They couldn't see him. So that was a big example of the spiritual realm at a very young age. Again, back then, you chalk it up to imagination. As you grow older, you forget these things. But um, through my experience in meeting Jesus, the revelations and him bringing back all these past traumatic experiences from the spiritual realm, it made me realize that, okay, I wasn't crazy back then. I understand that you can open doors to the demonic just from my everyday life, the things we say, the things we watch. Everything, the eyes are the window to the soul. So when we look at certain things, when we experience certain things, certain things come in. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, growing up, that was my introduction into the spiritual realm and things of that such. Um, fast forward, 
a little bit before uh, the biggest incident, my father passed away and my mother was struck with dementia. So I'm fresh out of high school now, 18 years old, you know, and practically I'm the man of a house. We know with dementia, you know, it, it takes away our loved one's mind. So she's basically a child again. So me being 18 and having a younger sister, I'm essentially the parent to my mom. And with that happening, my dad's passing, I turned heavily into alcohol. And it's so crazy about going back to those demonic doors that, that are open through our parents and generational curses. I remember being a kid and seeing my parents indulge in alcohol and the effects it had on them and cigarettes and things like that and saying, oh, when I get older, I will never do that. As a kid looking, you say, oh, this, why do they do this to themselves? Why do they act like this? When I get older, I'll never touch the stuff. Well, as I said, with generational curses, and given life circumstances, I did exactly that. I fell into the exact thing that I promised that I would never get into. And so with alcoholism, I know now that that's a spirit and it didn't start necessarily in overindulgence. It started with beer, you know, a little a beer here and there, then wine. But we know when we open these doors, the enemy, he has a way of tricking us into certain things. We have to understand that the enemy has been around far longer than we have. So there's none of us who can have or, or say that we can outwit or outsmart the enemy. You know what I mean? It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, we can do all things through Christ, you know, but so the alcohol uh, addiction progressed, progressed, progressed to the point, Brother Randy, I was drinking maybe a half a gallon of alcohol a day. I was not one mm. at a preference. You know what I mean? Whatever it was, let's do it. As long as I had a little juice or something to, to chase it with, I was game to go. And what started happening was those doors that were open as a kid, well, now, because it was passed down to me, those same spiritual things that were happening as a kid that I had wrote off, well, now they're amplified because now I'm an adult. So now it started with the black shadow figures, again, running rampant, Brother Randy. And at first, it's frightening me because now I'm an adult. Now, as a kid, you can kind of rationalize things to the imagination being young. I'm a full-fledged adult now, being 18, 19 and there. So now I'm knowing what I'm seeing and I can't rationalize it. And so I'm seeing these shadow figures out the corner of my eye and stuff like that. Another year or so progresses. And now it changes from me seeing these shadow figures out the corner of my eye to where they're just going right in, in front of my face. Now it's no longer just at home, brother Randy. I could be out at someone else's house. I'm seeing these shadow figures. I can be out in the streets. I'm seeing shadow figures. And the scariest part of that is about a year and a half into my addiction, I was no longer afraid. I kind of got used to it. I was in a mindset of it is what it is. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So yeah. that's that was just the addiction. So with that, things started to progress a little bit more. So now I'm drinking and driving. I'm seeing these shadow figures. I'm hearing voices that say, you know, maybe it's time for me to check out of here. You know what I mean? And I never had the courage to commit suicide. However, I was perfectly fine with death. I was ready to go. I believed, I would say to myself all the time, well, we gotta go from something. And if I'm seeing these spirits and if alcohol is gonna take me out, I had a good ride. That's the, the lie the enemy had fed to me. And I wanna also add in that at this time, Brother Randy, I was what we call on human standards, a good person. I would give the shirt off my back. Anything I had was someone else's. I never had a bad word to say about anybody. And I bring that up to show that none of us are good. And human mm. standards, we can be called good. And that thought led me up until when I had my accident. So fast forward, 
I'm out one day drinking and driving and I'm in my car and I let my seat back and I say, I'm going to take a nap. And when I woke up, I was in complete darkness. Now, what had come to happen was from other people testimony who told me what happened. I was in my car asleep. I woke up. I spoke to everyone. I started my car. I went up the road. Brother Randy, I have to tell you, I don't remember any of that. I don't remember going in my car to take a nap. I don't remember start turning the key. I don't remember pulling off. But the fact that people told me that I was verbal, I was communicating, that scared me more than anything because that let me know that I wasn't behind the wheel of my own person. Something or someone was communicating for me. Someone had taken, someone or something had taken over. So as I said, after that happened, I don't remember it, but I wake up and I'm in complete darkness. I can feel my physical body. All my senses work, but it's just utter darkness. So in my mind, maybe I'm blind. What happened to cause me to go blind? However, in this darkness, Brother Randy, I was at complete peace. And it's, it's weird to say I knew that I was safe. And that rocked me, too, afterwards, thinking back, because anybody being in complete darkness, there should be some alerts going on. You know what I mean? And after that, you know what I'm saying, I eventually come to and when I come to, I'm about a mile up the road, Brother Randy. In my pocket, Brother Randy, I have all my identification, all my debit cards, all my money, my house keys. But Brother Randy, I don't remember getting out of that car. I have no hmm. recollection. And I struggle with the fact that maybe I came to in a drunken stupor and got out the car and maybe just made my way down the road. Well, Brother Randy, I got pictures of that car that I was driving. It was completely smashed. And even if I did have the, the knowledge of the foresight afterwards to, to get out that car and flee the scene, there's no way in my condition I would think to grab house keys, identification, debit cards, all my personal belongings out the car. So that's just a testament that God's hand was on me and I know now that he used that situation to start the process of bringing me to him. So I wanted to just pause right there to say that even in our darkest times, and I'm realizing that with a lot of people, those dark moments really shows us who God is because he works in those dark moments to bring us to him. And that was the beginning of leading up into my uh encounter with Christ. You know, you highlight something, uh, Brother Larry, that is so important, to, I think, to understand, and that is that we don't live in a spiritual vacuum, that there's spiritual warfare going on all of the time, uh, and that there are thousands, if not millions of uh, both angels and demons warring over our soul. And you at an early age, even though you were not, you, you lived as what people would think as a good person, um, you, they, they find a way to get into your life. And, and you wrestled with that as, as a child. And it continued on to the point where it became familiar to you. Well, it's like they were part of your life. And, and then the alcoholism entered in and, and you were sucked into that. And it was kind of like more fuel for them to haunt you during your life. But during this life that you led, Jesus always has his hands on you. And so you had this accident, you're in the darkness, but there was something that Jesus had gotten a hold of in your life. And that led you to a point of encountering him, despite all of this, of these other attacks on you, 
that something, something that Jesus had, he found that little crack, that little opening. And uh, what was that? What led up to, to that time where he was going to introduce himself to you? And going into that, I like what you said about familiar. Because it's a thing such as familiar spirits. And those are definitely real. And looking back, I can see that these spirits, even from a kid on to adulthood, they had attached themselves to Brother Randy. But I also know this, that Jesus always had a plan and i'll get a little bit more into that now so now i wreck my car i'm at home because i don't have a car so now i got time and as soon as i got home after the accident for some reason i dropped to my knees and i prayed to god now let me preface by saying i always believed in god I just did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I would say all these things like, oh, you help people because that's how you get your blessings. And uh, if somebody does something to you, turn the other cheek. I knew a lot of the teachings of Jesus. However, the world had got to my mind that Jesus was not a real person. He was, um, he's just a, a, a character to control the masses, you know, heaven and hell was something, a scare tactic to make humans behave. And looking back, it's so crazy that I even thought that because Jesus is contradictory to everything that I used to hold against him. So my favorite thing was to say that, oh, God is real, but Jesus is not real. And I always thought that in my older age, but right before the accident things start to unravel, I start spewing that things out to other people. So it shows to say that I was hurting on the inside. And instead of, because I didn't know Jesus, it's crazy that my anger and my, my, my hatred and my woe is me because why is this happening to me? A so-called good person. I'm not like everybody else. Lord, why are you allowing these things to happen to me? So after the accident, I get home, I'm without a car and I drop to my knees and I'm praying to God. Because in my mind, I still don't believe in Jesus. And I get on my knees in the most vulnerable way, the most vulnerable thing I have ever said that came out of my mouth was, are you really going to let me die? I felt the spirit of death on me, Brother Randy. Mm. So when I said I saw these shadow figures and stuff like that. Not only was I comfortable with them, I felt impending death. I knew it was coming and I was okay with it. But in that moment, I, like a little kid, here I am. The only words that could come out of my mouth was, you're really going to let me die? Me? A good person like me? You're going to let me die. You're, you're so loving, but you're going to let me die. I'm dying. I can feel it coming any day now. Mm. And I said that prayer, Brother Randy, from the bottom of my heart. The first time, I believe, that I ever prayed. And it was actually from the bottom of my heart. Have I prayed before? Absolutely. But this time was different. I was at the end of my rope. There was nowhere else to go. And I heard a voice, not audibly say, go get the Bible in this room behind this shelf. And it's crazy, Brother Randy, that Bible had been given to me maybe when I was eight or nine years old because I had some... Um, upbringing in the church, you know, but like most kids, once you get a certain age and you don't have to go anymore, you know what I'm saying? You kind of stop going. And then I still didn't have that relationship with Jesus. So from that church upbringing, I knew to give, I knew to turn the other cheek. I knew to, uh, if you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. But I cannot stress enough. I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So when he told me to go get the Bible, he led me straight to it, a Bible that I hadn't seen in maybe over 10 years, a Bible that I haven't laid eyes on in the last place I would ever look. He led me straight to it as if I had seen it every day of my whole life. And I mm -hmm. grabbed that Bible, Brother Randy, and I started in Genesis. If I'd known then what I know now, I probably would have started in the New Testament. But I started in Genesis, and for the first time in my life, reading that Bible, I could not put it down. Hmm. Two reasons. One, because I'm so like, I'm at the end of my rope. So God, if 
I got to get to know you because you got to save me. I'm 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 on borrowed time here. And for two, if I'm being honest, I was trying to find anything that could make me say, see, God don't care. This ain't real. This is a fairy tale. But Brother Randy, as I began to read and flip those pages, if I'm being honest, it's as if that Bible was reading me. For the first time in my whole life, it made sense. I mean, it was like I was at a buffet. I mean, every waking moment, I'm flipping pages. That It was just that good to me. And so I'm reading it, I'm reading it, and I'm getting, like, finally understanding the stories. And about two days of that, my demonic attacks got a lot worse. At this point, I'm sleeping with every light on in the house. Now, I can't physically see what it is that's standing over me every night, but I kind of got like a vision of what it was. And the, uh, the best way I can describe it is maybe eight foot tall, very, very muscular, and horns. I saw it, but not with my physical eyes. I guess a better word for it was I saw it in the spiritual. And this thing would stand over me, right over my bed every night to the point where I could feel it breathing on me. And back then, I'm not into faith yet. I'm just now starting to search. So in my mind, I say, well, I'm sleeping with my Bible under the pillow every night, thinking that that would be <laughs> protection. You know, I'm like, as long as I got this Bible under my pillow, it can't touch me. It was so bad, Brother Randy, that it was parts of my house that I would not walk in because I was that scared. Every light stayed on in my house 24-7. Uh, I'm an adult and I'm watching, I got cartoons playing on my TV all night long because I was that scared. And that's crazy, even saying that out loud, it's giving me, I got a revelation that I reverted back to that little kid, that scared kid who had to have on cartoons and stuff all throughout the night just to feel secure or safe. And so I'm hearing stuff in the kitchen hit the floor. And this is going on all while I'm reading the Bible for, I want to say, about a two-week span. Eventually, Brother Randy, one night, I fall asleep, and I'm instantly transported into what I know now is the spiritual realm. And I say it's the spiritual realm because the area was definitely familiar. However, the colors here were a little bit more, the word I'm looking for is, Right. You know what I mean? They were a little bit, the colors were more detailed. And I'm outside and instantly I'm transported into a kitchen. And I'm in this kitchen and I'm amazed at the fact that this kitchen is exactly what I would imagine if I were to build a house myself. I, as, as I was saying earlier, we all from childhood and stuff, we all probably have pictured our perfect dream homes. If we were able to build a house ourselves, if we had unlimited finances, if we could put a house together, we know what that house would look like in our mind. Mm -hmm. And when I say it was that plus some, the lighting fixtures, the, the brick oven, um, um, just just the, the hardwood floors, it was decked out. So in my mind, I'm all like, what am I doing in my dream home? Like, what is this? <laughs> and as soon as I thought that, Brother Randy, about five inches from my face it was in a moment i'm face to face with jesus christ himself and why he was so close five inches from my face i have no idea but brother randy the first thing i did was lock into was his eyes they were the most greenish bluish eyes i have ever seen but what was so special about it it was as if you're looking in his eyes, but they never ended. It's like it was the deepest ocean you could ever see. Like you can stare at them and you you would never, you you could drown. You it they were that deep. And backing up a bit, I had no doubt in my mind that it was Jesus Christ. Me, somebody who believed that Jesus Christ wasn't real. God was always real, but this Jesus Christ guy was just, it was just a character, you know, something sprinkled in there to control the masses. I knew from the moment he came into my view exactly who he was, exactly what he stood for, and he had a look on his face as if it was it was loving, 
but it was kind of like he was like trying to figure me, like looking through me. And Brother Randy, that gaze, which probably only lasts about one second, felt like an eternity. But his eyes, I cannot stress that enough. It was full of love. He knew everything, Brother Randy. When I say everything, there was nothing I can hide. I could sense that he knew everything that I did, every trouble I had, every problem I had, every bad word, every good deed. He knows it all, not just from my past, but in my future. He could see all of it. And it was just so overwhelming. I was so overcome with love, Brother Randy, that before I knew it, it was as if magnets were on the floor and I slammed down face first and bawled crying. I mean, boo-hoo, crocodile tears, Brother Randy. It was just, I, I and I couldn't control it. It's like something literally pulled me to the floor and I was wrecked. I was definitely wrecked. Wow. You were, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, brother, that that Jesus was revealing himself, not because of your kind of your foreknowledge, because you didn't have any real knowledge of Jesus. I mean, you had doubted him and you you knew of God in a very kind of uh, general sense. But this Jesus character, if you will, was someone that you had doubted. And for some reason, he decided to reveal himself to you. Do you have any inclination at this point why you of all people that he would choose to reveal himself to? And Brother Randy, I struggle with that question even till today. I have no idea why I got the privilege to lay eyes on him in that way. I can only attribute to that God of... He's sovereign, and it was a reason why. Maybe the only thing I could surmise is to prove to me that all that rhetoric I was spitting about, oh, Jesus ain't real. He was just put here, you know, he's just a character. I feel like that was his way of saying, not only am I real, but I see you, I saw you, and I will continue to see you through because he's the beginning and the end. Brother Randy, I, and when I say he looked into my soul, Brother Randy, when I say there was nowhere to hide, if I'm being real, my body, my, my my physical body, wanted to get as far away from him as possible because, not because of anything bad, but the love coming off of him. It was, it was as if I would burst. I couldn't stand it. I have never <laughs> felt, you think that you love your children or your mother or your sisters and you would do anything for them. That love, that I felt not only could it encapsulate the whole world or the whole universe, it was obvious in that moment that people on this earth who probably rub us the wrong way or people, the worst person you could think of from, from Hitler to Mother Teresa, that love, I mean, he loves us all. Does he agree with everything we do? Absolutely not. but. He was there. He he formed us in the womb. He knew us before our mothers knew us. And so as I'm on that floor, Brother Randy, he says, stand up. And what's what's crazy about that, your vision, my vision there, I'm on the floor face down, Brother Randy. But when he says, get up, I could see his face at the same time. And when he said, get up, his mouth did not move. It's as if we were communicating telepathically. I heard get up. I saw his face when he said get up, but his lips didn't move. And the way he said get up was so soft, yet stern. It was, I can't even describe it. It was loving, but it was stern. It was authoritative, but it was filled with love. Like, you don't got to do that. Get up. And as I mustered up all the strength I could to get up off that floor, he immediately beelines into my kitchen area of this perfect construct of a house. And he goes into an oven. And what he has is a long wooden like stick, like they use at like the pizza places to, to put the pieces in and out of the oven. And he takes it and he sticks it in and he pulls it out 
And the first thing that goes on my mind is, why is Jesus making pizza? You know what I mean? <laughs> like Pizza now. And just like that, I wake up. And I wake up, and the sun is coming through my window, shining brightly on my face. And I feel like what I can only describe as leftover love. It's a presence so heavy that I, I'm waking up smiling ear to ear as if I had been laughing in my sleep all night. I, I was never so ready to get outside and seize the day, Brother Randy. It was, I, I, I can't explain it. I had never woken up that refreshed, that happy, as if I was at a comedy show the whole night. I woke up with that, that much joy. And instantly, my mind goes to, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. Fast forward, Brother Randy, a couple of days later, I'm at home. I'm still reading my Bible now. And now, Reading that Bible, instead of trying to find things to discredit God, now I'm eating it up to I'm all like, he's right. I'm looking at the characters in the Bible like, why are we doing this, guys? Can't you see how good God is? He bring, he, We go into captivity, and then he brings us out, and then we end up back, and he brings us. So now my whole mind has changed. Now I see, Brother Randy, that we're the problem. We are the problem. And as soon as I thought that, Brother Randy, I get hit with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell in me. And when that happened, Brother Randy, I go out my door that day, and for the first time in my life, outside looked different. I mean, the grass looked greener, the sky looked more blue. I can't explain it. It was as if I had been walking around with like fuzzy vision my whole life, and somebody gave me prescription glasses. Now everything is sharper. It's like not 3D, but everything is just so clear. And it's just my natural eyes. And I can only equate it to like maybe scales coming off the eyes. You know what I mean? And so now that's happening. And fast forward, coming to a close, um, this is about two or three weeks after my encounter with Jesus. I'm at work. I'm sitting in the car. I'm still thinking about this encounter because I'm still having questions like, why was Jesus making pizza? It does. It just didn't make sense. I like the brick oven that was in this apartment or 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 house we were in. That was a nice oven, but why did Jesus make a pizza? And then out of nowhere, I'm at work. I'm not even thinking about Jesus at the time. I get a download. It says that wasn't pizza. That was bread. Ah, uh. bread. A bread. And I'm all like, wait, 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 wait. That was. And now I'm thinking back on it. It was flat unleavened bread brother randy and i instantly start rejoicing and praising because we know from the word what the bread symbolizes he's the bread of life and i'm yes. and I'm, I'm smiling now i can hardly contain it i can hardly contain it because that's his body and i'm still gonna rev it's so much stuff to unpack from it that i'm still get revelations to this day from that from that encounter but i've gotten there okay He's the bread of life. You're now eating of his body. You know, you're a part of the body of Christ. Then I'm even thinking to how at the Last Supper with his disciples, how he made the bread and passed out the wine. And it's just so much stuff. And when that hit me, Brother Randy, I was wrecked. So it finally made sense. That wasn't pizza. That was bread. I'm a part of the body. He was he was showing me essentially that I like, I am the bread of life. What do he say? Uh, uh, the only way through the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The only way through the Father, the God that I've always believed in, who I always knew was there, minus Jesus. He was showing me that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through me. And when I say, Brother Randy, when I got that revelation, that was it for me. I knew then Jesus is who he says he is. He was there from the beginning. He'll be here at the very end, and he's sovereign, and he's loving, and, oh, man. Wow. Brother, I don't say this. I've, I don't think I've ever said this, and all of the tremendous guests that we've had on this program, but you are a preacher, brother. You are a preacher. You have a calling on your life. And I, I speak that just over you because I have this impression that what Jesus was doing in this special encounter 
that he had revealed to you was for um, for this purpose, certainly in our program today, in sharing the love of Jesus. But but there's an anointing on you to to spread the the great news of Jesus Christ to to the world. And so I just say that because the way that you're telling your story, uh, brother, is is so articulate and so pi- picturesque that it is one that is miraculous and understandable at the same time. That's hard to do. That's hard to do because to comprehend this in the spiritual realm, which is where you were at in how you relate to the physical realm of where you came from and your life beginning in your mother having Alzheimer's at a young age, you having to basically be the parent of your mother, uh, losing your father, the car accident, being caught in the demonic uh, attacks, the darkness that you found yourself. How would you, and kind of encapsulate all of this, brother, in terms of what you would tell others who are maybe in a similar position or maybe kind of questioning their faith at this point, what would you have to say to to those? I would definitely say that from my experience and what I've gained from other people's experience is that we come to God, unfortunately, in times of trouble. If it was anything I could ever change, it would be that I would have came to Christ in a season where I wasn't as far as at the end of my rope. It's, it's so sad that that's when we try to run to God. That's when we finally want to start that dialogue with God and get to know him once things are not so ideal for us. And I'm, I know that's just human nature, um, but my encouragement would be that just give God a chance. When you uh we question God in our life circumstances all the time, but you hit on it that everything that I've experienced and growing up, I see now that oh, that had to happen. This had to happen. So that this would happen. It's like a chain of events happening. And you really just spoke over my life because what you just shared with me is something I've heard before. And even in the body of Christ, I want to I want to put this out for maybe somebody who's listening. Even when you come to know Jesus, that does not by any means means that you're perfect. That does not mean that life necessarily would be better, you know. But the difference is I got help now. Now I know that this this mountain and these these bills and these tribulations. Now I know that oh, the battle's won. So now it's not by my strength anymore. I just have to sit back and say, God, I may not understand this, but I know it's gonna work for my good. And if I could give any encouragement to anybody out there, it would be to just seek God. Seek him with all your heart. Don't wait until you get to a point like myself and many others where you feel like you have nowhere else to go because he's there, he's been there, he was always there. Now that I look back in our conscious, those gut feelings, those thoughts we have, he's always been there. He loves us so much. He wants the best for us. And his burden is light. The only, he wants nothing in return. There is no, he, it would be different if he was a God that said, do this, do that, do that. He just simply wants you to exist and worship him But the thing about worshiping him is, it's simply loving each other. It's free. It is free. It costs us nothing. And I'm telling you, it's the best decision I ever made. And I'm, Brother Randy, I'm just at a loss for words, but that's what I would give. That's what I would say. Well, you know, there are are messengers and there, there are those who live out their message. What I mean by that is that your message is born out of both your life struggles 
and also the epiphany or inspirations that you glean throughout your life that cause you not to look back and say, why did, why did God take away my mother at an early age and my father? Why, why did he cause this pain and to somebody who really had never spoken a bad word about anybody? Why would he do good, bad things to good people? All of those questions that circle around in our mind, um, invariably, whatever, whatever life you came from or come from, uh, those are the questions, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, how does God, why does God allow suffering? All of those things. And your message really speaks to that because he knows our hearts foremost. So he knew your heart. And he knew that deep down inside um, that he could reach you because you were open to him and you, you really sought the, this love that was kind of missing throughout um, not knowing him, that is. But secondly, in your life, Brother Larry, there, there's a message here that reaches others because today, less than... 50%, according to, to a recent poll, are regular church attendees. In, in the UK, less than half the population now, according to another poll, don't even believe in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, and the, the only way to God. Um, we're kind of, it seems like we're losing the battle, so to speak, but yet, at the same time, I think God is waking us up to a fresh message of getting real and not just preaching at people to tell them the way it is, but sharing with them the way that that God's love in a way that cannot be denied. And you have that message. You have that message, brother, on you and within you. And um, so we want to, as a, as a ministry, we want to to help bring you out you're, you're doing that right now we're bringing you the attention but we want to foster that further uh, as you go forward in this uh um you know this destiny that god has called you to so when you look back on your life i'll ask you this uh, before we start praying which is one of my favorite times if not my favorite time when you look back on your life and the stream of things the demonic attacks the figure that appeared on at your bed that was um ghastly you know demonic looking and whatever dragon like and you look at these visages of these shadowy figures that were happening throughout your life that became familiar to you it was just just like uh seeing people on the street and you look at your your mother having had alzheimer's and you having to basically be the the, the father and the caretaker at this point you look back on that and you put it together in the storyline, which you've done very, very well. Um, what would you say that you pull out that kind of is the, is, is what the, the before and after, how you were before, you tried to live a good life um, and yet you fell into, you know, the effects of, of alcoholism and, and the effects of all of the trauma in your life as at an early age to now um, knowing Christ, you're still in the place where there are struggles. How do you contrast the before and after so that people can relate to it as to how they can kind of get through the darkness in which we're living today? I would say, and I'm glad you asked, uh, if you see me looking up because my mom is walking around now and, and stuff like that, but even with my mom's situation and my father passing, but specifically with my mom, I asked God, I said, God, why would you let her mind go? Because I think about my mother is she had me at an older age, around 36. And she always told me that she prayed to God that if you would let me have a son, I would give him back to you. And that's something that always stuck with me something that I have forgotten until after Jesus revealed himself to me. Because like I said, now I get revelations all the time. Maybe not every day. And he's teaching me not to be caught up so much in the spiritual. But one thing I know for sure is that we could never love someone more than Jesus loves them. 
So I don't understand why my mom's mind went and it hurt me, but he ensured me. He says, do you think for a second that you love your mom more than I do? And that I, if anybody can hear this, your children, your parents, grandparents, you can love them. You can wish the best for them. But if you really love them, you would try to point them in the direction of Jesus Christ because there's you can't possibly love them more than he does. He knew them before you. He knew you before them. He'll know you after them and vice versa. And that's that's one thing that he revealed to me that he loves not only me, but the people I so-called love from the bottom of my heart. He loves them infinity a million times more than that. And secondly, something that he revealed to me was that we know we all grew up on for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten sons for who shall ever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But what struck me that I feel like people don't talk about as much is John three seventeen, where he says, for God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it. He is here. He was sent to save us from ourselves. And I, I still, I'm all like, what? I've always not known John 3, 16, but why did I never read the next verse? That verse is so powerful that to know for someone like me, who always was a, a, a skeptic of Jesus or criticizer of Jesus and his teachings, to know that he came into the world not to condemn it, but to save it, to save us from ourselves, that's, that's like, for lack of better words, the best news that I've ever heard in my life. Because in our lives, basically, we get in the way of ourselves. We're always hustling and bustling, trying to climb the corporate ladder or make more money or be the best son or daughter or husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend. And ultimately, when we come to Jesus Christ, he knows the desires of our hearts. He knows what you want to do. And we can absolutely go out on our own and make these things happen. But for myself, and I'm sure for many others, once you get that job, once you get that car, once you get that relationship, once you get that promotion, you're like, now what? It's something will always be missing. It will never, it, nothing will ever fulfill you. And I'm pretty sure we can look at pop culture and we see things and artists of that nature and they show it every day. There's always something missing. And Jesus Christ is that peace. And if I could, like I said, if I could sum up the difference between me now and then is that I got help. I got help. And no matter what comes along, the battle is already won. I just got to sit back and just wait on my dad, my best friend hmm. to handle it. And now I know that when I go through these things, instead of saying, whoa, it's me, I'm all like, whoa, God, what are you trying to teach me with this? What am I supposed to get from this? And every time, like clockwork, once it's over, I'm all like, ah, I see why that had to happen. I appreciate that because without this, I would have never known how good, how merciful, and how on time he really is. Wow. We've seen your, uh, that, that's a tremendous message, uh, brother. We've seen your mother go back and forth there. And I applaud you for, um, you know, the, the, both being with your mother and keeping her at home there in a familiar um, surrounding. And we have so many. My mother, by the way, she had Alzheimer's. She lived to be, uh, she, she got Alzheimer's when she was older. She lived to be 93. And so I know what that's like uh, to go through that process. And I know it's hard, very, very hard. But I, I just applaud you, brother, for for being there for your mom. And uh, and we see her in the background. Occasionally, she's been walking around. So uh, that that is something that, uh, you know, I, I think we can give you tremendous credit for. So now we've, we've come to the point now we've been to church. Okay. So and now, now we're going to have the opportunity to pray with you. And I'm going to ask my brother Larry to, to pray for you and to lead you um, into a prayer, both to receive Christ. So, you know, 
on that day, eventually, that that you will leave this earth. It is inevitable. 100% chance (laughs) that you're going to heaven. You'll see your mansion that uh, my brother talked about, uh, that, well, that, that, uh, the dwelling place that Jesus promised uh, for those who believe in him and are children of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so you have that opportunity and also a prayer uh, for those of you who may know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you're going through tough times. So, uh, Brother Larry, will you uh, lead us in prayer in, uh, in closing? Absolutely. And right before prayer, uh, I just wanted to say that my mom, like I said, with dementia, she has not interrupted this podcast or, or this interaction at all. And that is, I got to say, God is moving. The spirit is moving because this is unbelievable. She hasn't come and pressed a button or covered the camera or anything. So the Lord is definitely having his way. So I would definitely love to pray us out, uh, Brother Randy. And I thank you for uh, coming on and your words of uh, affirmation and, and the love and the work you're doing to help people like myself who are going through these things and stumbled across your platform to learn that I'm not alone in this thing. And it's other people going through the exact same thing. And we've got, we need to hear it. So, Well, you're, I think the Lord is ministering to your mom right now and has been, as you've been sharing. So, uh, hi to, uh, to brother Larry's mom there. And, uh, let's, uh, let's start praying. Thank you, Larry. Oh, Father God, we come to you today just to say thank you for everything you've done, doing, and will do. I pray today, dear Lord, that you reveal yourself. I pray for revelation for those who are searching. I thank you for your peace, dear Lord, that you bestow upon us, those of us who are willing and those of us who are unwilling to get to know you, because you reign over the just as well as the unjust, Father God. And I just want to say thank you, dear Lord, and how much it is, it is a privilege to be able to call you my friend, because I can do nothing without you. I wouldn't want to if I could. And I just ask, dear Lord, that today that this interaction that we had here touches somebody, and let them know that you are always there. You've been there in the darkest times and in the best of times, and that all that we have to do is reach out and you'll be there with open arms. To those who knock, the door will be open. And we stand firm in that, and we love you. And once again, we need you. And it's just a privilege to get to know you. All these things we ask and pray for in your mighty name, Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed uh, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, for what he did uh, for us on the cross, in taking on the the sins of uh, of the world for those who confess him as their Lord and Savior, uh, please let us know on on randyk.org on the contact page there. Uh, we'd like to reach back out to you. And uh, my brother Larry, I thank you so so much for sharing this tremendously impacting account in your life and also your ministry, which. Uh, I'm kind of guessing it's going to be uh, launched to to a greater degree here. I, I think there's something in your future which is more uh, more kind of full time in terms of your uh, your preaching and carrying uh, this message of God's love to the, to others. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Randy. I surely appreciate it. I receive everything you said, and only time will tell. I just hope that I can. Do everything in my power to stay out the Lord's way and let him work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a great attitude to have uh, in this hard, this hard life, wherever you live and whatever you're going through. Uh, this is not home. And so uh, we'll end with uh, this great news. And that is, if you are indeed in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Until next time, take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.